Hey, welcome to Tank Talk. Uh, I'm your host, Bob Tanker, and this evening's guests are two distinct, distinguished, profound individuals. We have Congressman John Lewis and Reverend C.T. Vivian of the Civil Rights Movement. Gentlemen, thank you. Thank you for coming on to Tank Talk. Congressman Lewis, American politician and civil rights leader working hand in hand with Dr. Martin Luther King and Reverend T.C. Vivian, <laughs> U.S. Senate, uh, Representative for Georgia's 5th District since 1987, mm -hmm. only living member of the Big Six leaders of the Civil Rights Movement, was chairman of the Students' Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, a member of the Democratic Party. Lewis is a member of the Democratic leadership of the House of Representatives. He ser serves in the WIP organization since shortly after his first election to the United States Congress. He is senior chief deputy WIP and has held this position since 1991. Congressman Lewis. Reverend C.T. Vivian, a distinguished minister, author, organizer, leader of the civil rights movement, one of the leaders of the civil rights movement, with Dr. Martin Luther King. He participated in freedom rides and sit-ins across the country. Reverend Vivian helped found numerous civil rights organizations, including Vision, the National Anti-Klan Network, and the Center for Democratic Renewal. In 2012, he returned to serve as interim president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Welcome, welcome to Tank Talk. Gentlemen, it is a pleasure it is a pleasure being here. Now, my first question to you two is this. After reading some of the stuff about you and everything, I looked at your childhood because my childhood reflects your parents and what they did. Congressman Lewis, tell us a little bit about your childhood. Well, thank you very much for having us on. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up in rural Alabama, mm -hmm. a son of sharecroppers. Mm -hmm. I grew up very poor, wonderful mother, wonderful father, third child and 10. Mm -hmm. I had uh, six brothers and, and three sisters. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked on the farm and I didn't a hot sun, I didn't like it. Uh, <laughs> I, didn't, I, didn't like, I didn't like picking cotton, gathering peanuts, pulling corn. And I would say to my mother, I said, this is hard work. And she would say to me, boy, hard work never killed anybody. I said, well, it's about to kill me. <laughs> and uh, I would complain. Uh, and she accused me of being nosy because I asked so many questions about everything. And uh, I felt they were going deeper and deeper in debt right. every year. And I felt there was something else they could do. Mm -hmm. And so I would complain. And as a young child, I would bus past these wonderful, beautiful white schools. And uh, I got to hand me down books with other kids' name in the books, and I didn't like it. And I kept asking questions. When we would visit the little town of Troy, 50 miles from mm -hmm. Montgomery, a visit Tuskegee, a visit Montgomery, I saw these signs that said white men, colored men, white women, colored women, white waiting, colored waiting. And I would say, why? Why? To my mother, to my father, my grandparents, my great grandparents. They would say, that's the way it is. Don't get in the way, don't get in trouble. But in 1955, I heard of Rosa Parks. I heard of Martin Luther King Jr. I heard Dr. King speaking on old radio. And his words inspired me. The action of the people in Montgomery inspired me. They gave me a way out. In, in 1956, with some of my brothers and sisters and cousins, we went down to the public library. I was 16 years old, 16. trying to get a library card, trying to check out some books. And we were told by the librarian that the library was for whites only and not for colors. I never went back to that library, to not the same building, but the Pike County Public Library in Troy, Alabama, until July 5th, 1998. Wow. I was in the Congress uh, for a book signing of my book, Walking with the Wind, and hundreds of blacks and white citizens showed up. And after the end of the program and the book signing, mm. they gave me a library card. And uh, That's a great deal of forgiveness on your part. Well, you know, that was what the movement was all about. Mm -hmm. The ability, the capacity uh, mm -hmm. to forgive and, and to move on. And I remember on another occasion after the sit-ins and going through the Freedom Rides, 
I was beaten and left bloody with a seatmate of mine who was white in a little town called Rock Hill, South Carolina. Yeah. And we were left in a pool of blood. And many years later, to be exact, in February of 2009, mm -hmm. a month after President Barack Obama had been inaugurated, one of the guys who was a member of the Klan came to my office in Washington and said, Mr. Lewis, I'm one of the people that beat you. Will you forgive me? Please, he God. said, I want to apologize. Mm -hmm. He came with his son who was in his 40s. Mm -hmm. The guy was in his 70s. Mm -hmm. And his son started crying. He started crying. I started crying. They hugged me. I hugged them back, and we called each other brothers. Thank you. TC, yep. Reverend Vivian, tell us a little bit about your, your childhood. I was right at the end of, uh, uh, right at the beginning, really, of uh, the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, everything that I was to be and about was connected with education. Mm -hmm. And as soon as that happened, uh, all the banks closed. Wow. I mean, just closed. And uh, which meant there was going to be no money. So we lost the farms. And uh, so what do you do then? And this was the pride of the men uh, who would, uh, everybody was trying to find out uh, what they could do, I mean, uh, that would be solid. And the owning of farms was it because that's what we were right after the, my uh, rank proves it, right afterwards. Mm -hmm. The, uh, uh, and, but men have a hard time taking all of that. And when they lost the farms, both my uh, uncle, uh, great uncle was the uh, first one of the family to uh, go to college and to graduate mm -hmm. from college, Lincoln University in Missouri, all right? Uh, the, uh, my grandmother always wanted to go to college, could not go. Uh, so I became a special project, right? Uh, and she taught me, when I started school, I knew the first three and a half years, right? And I knew that because later on in the white school, but my grandmother was the one to see that we moved out of a segregated environment. Mm. We uh, went uh, to go to a college town. Mm. So the first one we left, uh, uh, we left when we left Missouri was we stopped in Macomb, Illinois. Mm. It was a college town uh, and uh, uh, set up life there. And the, uh, 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 I started to school uh, late. Uh, uh, I have my, my cards grade cards now, right? And uh, I have nothing on that first, uh, <laughs> on, that fir on that first semester, right? And the, uh, uh, but, um, uh, and how I know about the third grade is because uh, we moved into another room mm -hmm. uh, for some program or other that they were doing at the school. And the, uh, and I uh, saw what they had on the board in the third grade, right? And uh, I knew it, because Grandma had taught me, right? Grandma taught you. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, 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 and the, uh, so I knew I had it made there, mm -hmm. right? So uh, I never worried after that. But uh, when you went upstairs to the six, uh, to the three through six, first through three, mm -hmm. on the first floor, right. second floor, <coughs> uh, 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 three through six, uh, the four through six, mm -hmm. right? four, five, and six. And uh, 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 I, uh, uh, a friend of mine hated to go to the fourth grade because he'd have to go upstairs. And you could hear them singing up there, to hear Mrs. Horney singing uh, Old Black Joe. Oh, no. 
Oh, and no. His name was Joe, and he just he he didn't want to graduate to the to fourth, fourth grade. grade right? mm -hmm. He couldn't help it, yeah. uh, uh, and he did. Yeah. But uh, uh, and uh, here's what I learned all the way through. Everybody liked me, so I thought that they were not prejudiced. But then I, how they answered to and looked at and talked about uh, 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 other black people mm -hmm. in school and in, mm -hmm. and in the town. And I knew that they were racist. I was just their H&IC. Right. right? <laughs> uh, uh, and, and, uh, uh, but basically what it was is that uh, I liked the things they liked, right? right. Uh, here again because of Grandma, right? And the, uh, uh, well, basically, I just liked the same basic things they did. Uh, so that uh, uh, my childhood was not that bad. When I hear John talk about it, it just uh, uh, it's always, it's always touched me. What made both of you? You know, John, you went on to, you know, talk about, you know, uh, getting your library card movement. But what? You said you heard Dr. Luther King. What was it like working with Dr. King? Well, t to hear to hear Martin Luther King Jr. on, on the radio, um, and later to meet him. I mm -hmm. met him in 1958 when I was 18. Mm -hmm. Met Rosa Parks a year early in 1957. They gave me a way out. Mm -hmm. They they provided me with the inspiration. They gave me the tools. Mm -hmm. They to fight, to stand up, and, and, and just find a way to get in the way. And I got in the way. I got in what I call good trouble, <laughs> necessary <laughs> trouble. I, I, I wanted to do whatever it took to destroy the system of segregation and racial discrimination. I felt it was evil, mm -hmm. it was vicious, it was a sickness, and it had to be removed from American society. What, 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 when did you think Reverend Vivian, that it might be your last march or your last sit-in. I never had that feeling. I didn't even worry about it. I'm talking about I, as I far know what as you're talking about. you know. Uh, but I, that never bothered me. Uh, I, I uh, you, you see, you have to see how it came through. I would have been white, quote unquote, if I had not uh, read a given book. Mm -hmm. Because I was that sort of H and I C. I could go in the stacks at the public library where nobody else could go. I don't mean black or white. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, they they just like me mm -hmm. at the library, so I could go. I could go in the stacks, right? And I, you know, I was thinking the contrast because uh, uh, you couldn't go at all, and I and they overdid it with me. <laughs> <laughs> see, see, so. So I, I was reading, I could always go back to the stacks and set up in one of those big windows and, uh, and, and uh, uh, read what I wanted to, mm -hmm. right? And when I finished something, I could go f get something else that I might want to read, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I saw a book on the shelf called uh, 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 The Story of the American Negro by James Welton Johnson, of, of, of the poets by James mm -hmm. Welton Johnson, right? Mm -hmm. So here I was, I said, and when I saw it, I saw it, uh, it was on the top shelf, and I said, uh, uh, I said, uh, no, 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 oh, where do they get this uh, 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 story of black, and black poets, right? Mm -hmm. I said, uh, there's only one, Dunbar, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and that was, a, you know, because that's the one we all knew. Mm -hmm. But we only knew Dunbar's when I really read him and uh, didn't have to hear him with all the dialect and stuff mm -hmm. uh, that was really half uh, funny, quote unquote, right? So and they had to have the southern drawl, you know. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's the point. Uh, but he had a few poems, but I didn't know that mm -hmm. until, until after uh, I was reading James Walton Johnson. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that, uh, 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 that had a whole different understanding of mm -hmm. how black people lived, right? And how it reached in the heart. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what's the great woman poet that just died? Maya Angelou? Yeah, see, that title mm -hmm. of her first book mm -hmm. uh, was, uh, was from, uh, 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 from him. 
But I didn't know that, right? And, but I, what I'm trying to say is that we had a different life. My life just crossing the border, mm. all right, was totally different if we'd stayed on that side of the border. Right. My life reading white literature about, about me or about us mm -hmm. was totally different than reading us about us. Mm. And, and it hit me so deep that it made all the difference in the rest of my life. Uh, two experiences, right? One of them, my grandmother passed me uh, 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 and, uh, uh, and I had found a book in her library. I was looking at it, it was called Men of Mark, mm -hmm. right? And uh, uh, I was uh, reading it. She looked over my shoulder as she passed through the house and, and uh, uh, she said, uh, and I had the book open and she read it over my shoulder and she said, those are race men. And the way she said it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, told me something totally different from anything I'd read by black or white. Mm -hmm. it, only, it only, and then when I came to find uh, James Walton Johnson, mm -hmm. and I read all these various poets, right? Mm -hmm. And then I found out what life was really like being black. Mm -hmm. And I found out what it meant for me. And I didn't, how deep it touched me, I didn't, I couldn't know until I came to the point that, uh, that uh, I, I was, a was, uh, 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 year and a half later, mm. and found out that I didn't use Murray's anymore. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. It both of you, because this is important. You know, when you go through the struggle like you guys have gone through, I'm talking about this is national, this is global, yeah. you know what I mean? When it finally hit television and people began to say, oh my goodness, I didn't realize this was going on in this country. Yeah. You know, I, I need to do something. If you had to change, you know, in the struggles you went through, and I've seen, I've seen both of you on television. Mm -hmm. I've seen, you, you know, when you were going through the struggle, straight out in front, right out there in front. If you had to change one or two things in the movement, what would they be? I don't. I. I, I don't know. Um, I think I would have spent more time mm -hmm. learning from uh, individuals like Jim Lawson, mm -hmm. Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. uh, How much time I, did you spend with them? Well, I, I really felt. You know, Dr. King was a very young man. He was when, when he yeah. was assassinated, and you never thought. You, I've always thought and felt that he would be around for a long time. Uh, he, he. He provided inspiration, but he was more than just a speaker, more than a person that prov yes. he provided leadership. Oh, Did you ever, and, it, here's the thing, it, mm -hmm. here's the thing, I'm gonna let you finish. Did you ever <laughs> think that what happened to him was gonna ever happen? What happened? No, we, ne we never, I, I never thought it would happen. We, you, Even oh, though you, you came you, that you, close? Yeah, but you live under the threat of death. Oh, and we, you, you get letters, you get telephone calls, we were beaten. All the time. And, but uh, somehow you felt that we all will live and, and yeah. we'll be around. Yeah. And so when someone like a, a Martin Luther King, a Mega Everett, the people that are you know known, but there was countless individuals, whether it was Jimmy Lee Jackson or mm -hmm. the three civil rights workers, or other Fuller girls, yeah. and others really. Yeah, uh, but, but you see when uh, when he says that, right? That's true for me. I had already had nonviolence, right? Uh, 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 and uh, we had won, right? In Peoria, Illinois, nine years that's before right, that's right. Be, be, right. before Martin came on the right. scene, right. right? There were other nonviolent leaders, right? That had gotten over to persons like me. I was vice president of the NAACP, That's uh, right. uh, uh, and uh, uh, it got over to me early, right? But but the point is, because I knew nonviolence, when Martin came on the scene winning, the wife and I knew immediately 
right? Because he, she had had some nonviolent experiences mm -hmm. because her minister had gone to Morehouse, by the right. way, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, so uh, what we did, we started producing and saving materials. I was an editor at the Sunday School Publishing Board of the okay. National Baptist Convention, right? So what happened, it allowed me to, to publish stuff about Martin, right? But then it scared the, the, the publishing house, right? They thought that uh, white people may destroy the publishing house because this radical uh, colored <laughs> one was, uh, 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 was there. And uh, so, uh, they, but they were very clever about it. They said, uh, uh, Reverend Vivian, you're involved in the movement and uh, uh, we would like for you to have more time at that. So uh, uh, why don't you take your materials home and you can work on them when you want to? <laughs> what they meant was, would you get out of here? Would you get out of here? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, know, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I had an opportunity to, to speak with Andrew Young, one yeah. of your contemporaries, yes. right? And uh, I had asked him this question when he was, I said, when, when Dr. King was assassinated, I said, after things seemed to slow down, it, you know, it was, you know, was he the head head uh, uh, or what's, what made the, the movement slow down? You know what I mean? Who became the leader or who was in place to become the leader like, you know, he was and, you know, who was going to be that leader? Yeah, but he never slowed down, remember. He was murdered. He didn't slow down. He was he, taken. He was yeah. taken. He was taken, but yeah. I'm talking about once he was taken. And people didn't see his face, like, you know. But but the no movement. one but no one could replace mm -hmm. Martin Luther King Jr. That's Other the point. people tried, but no right. one. No. He was the undisputed leader. That's he was point. more than a symbol, but he was the personification mm -hmm. of the hopes and dreams and aspiration of a lot of people, mm -hmm. not just African Americans, yeah, but that's hundreds right. and thousands and million people. Talk in America, but around the world. Mm -hmm. So when he, when he was assassinated, when he died, something died in all of us. I know it did. And it, it I can feel it. I it, feel it, it. It died in America. It had a psychological it, effect on people all over America, but around the world. And that's, you know, he was one of a kind. Can, yeah. And we won't be so lucky. Mm -hmm. We won't be so blessed to see his likeness. I think God Almighty brought him here for time. But he, but he did something. And maybe it was in God's will because when he went on, you guys went on. You guys went out. On, either on your own, you became a congressman, a famous minister, author, and you began to tell. It's almost like the apostles being sent out. You know what I mean? That, that's yeah, well, what I know what you're saying, okay. but, but, but what you have to see okay. is that. Uh, 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 there was that what people needed, mm -hmm. only Martin could give. Okay. Right. Uh, this is why I was going to tell you about publishing the materials. We, m the wife and I, went out and got ma got materials mm -hmm. of uh, Martin. I interviewed Martin right after he, because uh, 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 Fisk University gave him an honorary doctorate, and uh, it was easy for me because I was at the publishing house mm -hmm. uh, to interview him. Right. right? I've got, and I've got one of the booklets we did. We did a 24-page booklet and paid for it ourselves, and really we, weren't, we didn't get paid very much, right? <laughs> uh, but but uh, because, uh, and, and at that year of the National Baptist Convention, uh, we gave out uh, uh, hundreds of these 24-page pieces uh, because the story was there. We both, as I said, had been in nonviolence. Our, our fear was, not for ourselves mm -hmm. or the people in general, mm -hmm. right, but that Martin was going to get killed, right? And we wanted people to have that nonviolent message, right. all right? Because we knew that, you see, it was the strategy. It wasn't just the, the person mm. or somebody following mm. Martin. It was the strategy, right. right? Is that the strategy of nonviolent direct action? I don't even say nonviolence by itself anymore. Mm -hmm. Nonviolent direct action, all right? Mm -hmm. Is that if people would learn it, 
they could change things. I, I, and I'm still saying, I was in, in Brazil this mm -hmm. day before history, right? And, uh, and I was saying something like the same thing, is that uh, when you learn the strategy of nonviolent direct action, huh, mm. then you can begin to talk seriously about Martin King. Let me ask you a question. Yes. You guys fought for voter rights. You fought, you gave your lives, you gave your blood, your families, gave up time and everything else. We're going through a voter suppression right now. Mm -hmm. How does that strike you? And well, where does it strike you? Well, when the Supreme Court made that decision, mm -hmm. striking a certain section of the voter rights side, mm -hmm. it made me so sad. Yeah. I wanted to cry, but the tears wouldn't come. And I kept thinking about how many people died in the struggle for the right to vote. Me too. And many people didn't live to see an African American become president of the United States. Mm -hmm. Many people who struggled never had an opportunity to register to vote. They stood in those unmovable lines. And today, there's a systematic, deliberate effort to make it harder and more difficult for people to participate. But and it's not just a Southern thing. No, but why? why? Why would they see the struggle, they know the struggle, they knew what people went through, and why? Well, you know, we call ourselves <laughs> United States of America, and why are we putting this on the table? Well, but the vote is precious. It's mm -hmm. almost sacred, mm -hmm. and it's powerful. It's the most powerful nonviolent instrument or tool yeah, we have in a democratic society, okay. and people fear it. They fear the power. America is changing. Mm -hmm. In a short time, the minority will be the majority. That's right. People fear that. They fear the unknown. And we got to learn to live together. As Dr. King was said, we got to learn to live together as brothers and sisters. sisters. Or we were perished that's as fools. Right. That's right. He's, uh, Is it? But you see, uh, we are in the process of learning. There are people that fear that, all right? Is that when we're talking now about the changes and their, the, the idea of preventing us from voting, you're thinking about uh, the Cook brothers, for instance, Oof. have set aside six billion dollars, three billion to be used in the coming election, more if necessary out of the six. Another six billion they're setting aside, uh, probably building on, right, is uh, 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 for whatever use is necessary to take over government. Look, uh, to be real serious, all right, read a book called uh, a capital in the 21st century, 700 pages, right? It's a real serious book, uh, uh, and, and, and what's involved in it is an understanding that uh, 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 what money is going to do, and this is the way I interpret it, right? But I'm not the only one. I've read a lot of, a lot of stuff. Is that, is that, that uh, uh, when you think about the money that they're putting together, you also have to think about the fact that we're living in, in a one world situation. The fight that's going on now, we uh, uh, people who believe in war are going to have to fight, right? Because uh, w uh, what is going to really happen is, is that, that the billionaires of the world are going to come together, not one or two, or not just in one country, right? And, and their decisions, who they pick, all right, and who they back then, all right, are going to be the ones that are going to be in charge of the whole voter matter in each one of the democratic countries, right? And, and when we look at that, we begin to understand that democracy will never be ours again unless we don't stop it now. Gentlemen, right? gentlemen. And, and, and this is this is why there's the need and the necessity of talking about the people themselves, like the brothers, right? Uh, uh, not not our brothers. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, uh, see, because that has to be seen clearly. Uh, because if we don't see it clearly, right. uh, 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 what the, what the future brings, we will not know. All right, and we've. And, and if the vote is taken away, mm -hmm. uh, blinded in any way, mm -hmm. we've, we will have to fight again 
nonviolently, all right? Mm -hmm. Because and educate everybody in the country. I want us to start now. Thank you. Listen, time has run out. This has been a great time. Tomorrow night, we're going to see you at Union Chapel, mm -hmm. okay, uh, in the conversation. Yeah. I yeah. want to thank both of you for taking time out of your busy day. I know, uh, Reverend uh, uh, Vivian, you just came in from Brazil, and, and uh, Congressman uh, Lewis, you just flew up from Washington, mm -hmm. and you came here today and, and on the show. I want to thank you for that. Well, I don't want to thank you both for making the door and making my steps a little lighter as I went through life. I want to thank you both. And I want to thank you for tuning in to Tank Talk. And until next time, this is your host, Bob Tankard, saying good evening. Mm -hmm.